The truth about your land investing journey, actually the truth about your entrepreneurial journey is it's gonna look like this. You're gonna go zoop, plateau, zoop, plateau, zoop, plateau, zoop, plateau. And at each one of these plateaus, you're gonna need a new right. skill stack to get to the next level, okay? It's a classic adage of what got you here won't get you there, okay? See, so many people throwing the same shit at the wall thinking it's gonna work. It doesn't work like that. And when you come into this business, you're stuck like this. You come into this business in a plateau. And apologies, my mic is in the way. You see, you come in at a plateau. That's a problem. So let's fix that. Okay. So I'm a big believer of the right information at the right time. Okay. That's why when people come inside Leah, we don't just give all the information at once. It's sequential because when you first start, there's just a few things that are really important. And when you move beyond that, there's a few other things that are really important. And you need that stuff at the right time. The funny thing is that for some people in flame business, they think that once you master this, it's just up and to the right. I can't tell you anything is farther, couldn't be farther from the truth. I am constantly trying to work my way through new plateaus because unfortunately I have this stupid little thing in my head where I like to grow and it causes a lot of pain because of it. So anyways, um, you're coming into the land business, your brand spanking new, here are the three things you're going to focus on. Okay. The first thing that you need to master is picking markets. Okay? You can buy land at any old place in the U.S. There's too many places to choose from. There's over 3,000 counties in the U.S. Very few of them are actually good. Okay. The hardest part about the land business is selling the land. Buying land is pretty easy. So what can we do to make land selling easier? Well, we can work in markets where there's unbelievable demands for the right kind of inventory. So you need to decide what kind of land are you going after, right? Define your business, define your asset class. This kind of trips people up, but there are so many different kinds of land in the land business, right? There's so many different sub strategies or businesses within the land business. So pick one, okay? What we, can, what we, what we need to do is we need to create parameters to kind of tighten up the amount of options that we have. So if you look at our business, we say, hey, we like to go after what we call rural recreational land. Five acres to maybe 40 or 100 acres. I mean, it's not an exact science. Call it two to six hours outside of like a somewhat major-ish city, right? A, a place that has, you know, dozens of thousands of people, not like 2,000 people. Um, and that can be a lot of cases kind of our buyer base from those cities. So that's the kind of definition that we've created for our land business. That's really what we teach a lot of our students. And so when we start looking at markets, if it doesn't fit into those criteria, boom, just weed it out. The problem is most land investors are opportunists, right? They'll do any deal that comes across their desk. The problem is you might get stuck with crap. And I've been stuck with crap deals. They turn into black holes in your business that suck up a disproportionate amount of time. What you really want to think about is not so much can I make money on this deal? Because the truth is you can make money on almost every deal in this business. It's pretty crazy. It's about how much friction do I have to go through to make money on this? If a deal makes you two grand and it takes nine months to sell and you have to chew through 400 different buyers, that's not easy, right? When we have deals where we get three offers same day when we list the property and we make 50 grand on the deal, I'll take the latter option, right? And a lot of that just comes down to the markets that we decide to participate in. The good news is it doesn't cost anything to pick different markets. You just gotta develop that skill set. Okay, the next is what we call price here. It's really gonna be actually underwriting, okay? There's two things that can take you out of this business faster than anything else. First off is spending all of your marketing dollars in crappy markets. It's a horrible position to be in. We see it every month. It's effed up. People come in, they watch a few of my YouTube videos or someone else's YouTube videos and say, this looks easy. I'm going to do it on my own. And then they get smacked by the market. Right? And we've had people that have spent 40 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand on marketing and gotten no deals. That's not so much just a marketing problem, believe it or not. There's some other problems that we'll go through, but that has a big piece to do with it. Okay. Um, same thing, the amount of people that come to us and say, Sumner, I haven't sold a deal in six months, right? I bought some properties, they're just not selling. Well, you either were working in a crappy market or you under, you were, you're underwriting the deal was, was, was inappropriate, was inaccurate or both. So we need to develop the skill set of underwriting deals. Really the method there is pretty simple, okay? We're doing kind of our quote unquote due diligence. We need to look at access, both legal and physical. We need to look at topography, how the property sits. Is it hilly, is it flat, is it in the valley? We need to go look at is it in a wetlands or is it in a flood zones or anything on the water on the property is going to make it kind of soggy. We need to think about utilities, right? So is there you know city sewer and water and electric on the property? If not, okay, we're gonna need maybe a well and septic. Well, is it so steep that it won't percolate? You gotta start kind of thinking through those things. One of the things that I think is really helpful is to think through what is the use case of this property? Who's gonna come and buy this property? And can it do what that person would want it to do? So if you're buying a quarter acre a lot in a subdivision where obviously the use case is to build a house on it, but it looks like this and there's no sewer there, you're not going to be able to put a septic system on that most likely. It's not going to perk. 
So the one use case that it really has is limited. So if I take the value from being you know, 90% of retail to 20% of retail, because you can't do the thing that you're meant to do on it, right? So I really like to think about the use cases of these properties. Like, okay, can our due, does our due diligence align with what I think someone would want to use this for? Okay? And the next thing is we need to figure out values. And this is like the area that stumps everyone. It's so easy. We teach a three-part framework for valuing land. The first is proximity. Okay. Everything in real estate is local. Properties that are close to this property that just sold, that's going to be more relevant than the property that's 20 miles away, even if it looks very similar. Okay. Proximity always wins in the land business and any real estate business. Proximity. The next thing is what we call features. Okay. Our property is wooded, it's slightly hilly, and it has a river in the back. Well, a property that also has that's way more relevant for comps than one that's a barren grassland that's flat or has a valley on it. It's just not, this is an apples to oranges comparison. As much as possible, we want an apples to apples comparison. But again, this is an order of importance. So proximity will trump some of those features. But typically, things that are within proximity to your property typically have the same features, right? At least physically. It's rare that you're going to be buying a property that's wooded and the adjacent lot's not wooded. It does happen, but it's very rare. The last thing we look at is recency, okay? The land business, real estate in general, it's at ebbs and it flows. It's not constant in terms of values always being pegged at one price. And so what happened last week is way more relevant than what happened last month. And so we want to find comps that are as recent as possible. But my recommendation for you there is go and look at what's under contract right now, obviously, and then go kind of ascend from one month, three months, six months. One of my favorite things to do is a way to help kind of value land because in some cases you'll find there's really no sold comps or very few around, but there might be some on-market comps. Well, we can go and look at those and we can apply a discount rate to them, right? Land never sells at its retail price, especially if it's listed by a realtor. So we might say, hey, 70% of that value uh, is what we think it's going to sell for. So if it's listed at 100, we might say, well, I think it's going to sell at 70, so we can base some of our underwriting off of that, right? It doesn't just have to be sold comps. What we tell our team is five on-market comps, so five active listings, five sold comps. That's usually enough data if you're using that kind of rubric to make an educated decision on value. Now, the next step from there is you got to figure out, okay, well, what kind of what kind of land player do I want to be, right? So let's say we've assumed, I think this property is worth 100 to 120 using Sumner's comping framework. Great. Now you've got the executive decision of, do I want to be the low ball investor that comes in and offers 30 cents on the dollar? Your acceptance rate is going to be way lower, but when you get a deal, it's going to be a big deal. Or do you want to be more like Sumner and say, you know what? I'm happy to offer 50% and do more deals. That's just how I roll, right? I'd rather have some more deals in the pipeline than just like swinging for the fences on our offers and trying to low ball everyone. Those deals do come along. It's just a lot of work. And so like, if you look at how much marketing you have to do to get those kinds of deals, it's just a ton of work. I'd rather not. <laughs> I'd rather, I'm happy to go make 100% ROI or 120 or 90% on a deal opposed to 200%. Sure, I'll take it. So then you got to figure out how you're going to make your offer, right? Where are you going to be at? Um, one thing that's important to note here, guys, be conservative in your underwriting. I see a lot, a lot of people that get screwed up on comping land. They do one of two things or two of two things. One, they use the average. Averages are stupid, okay? Be careful of averages, right? You're in a bar, you're sipping some tequila or something like that. I don't know, that sounds disgusting, but you are. Bill Gates walks in. If you take the average of the room, you're probably a billionaire now, or at least worth a couple hundred million, depending on how many people are in the room. But you're not actually worth that much, right? So averages are misleading. I see a lot of people that will go and aggregate 10 comps, and there's like two comps way on the high end, 200K, and the remaining eight comps are 60, 70K. In fact, I just saw this yesterday, and the thing, We'll blend them together and my property is probably worth whatever, 130. It's like, no, let's use the median here. Um, your property's definitely not worth that much. And let's, let, let's actually use some discretion and remove outliers. So you definitely gotta be careful on the removing outliers parts and not using the averages that can get you really, really screwed up. The next mistake that I see people doing with their underwriting is that they falsely assume that they're gonna somehow sell above everyone else or maximize retail price. That never happens, right? Expect to sell about 90% of what you think you're gonna sell for versus retail, right? So if everyone listed to 100, I'm probably coming in at 90, 95, something like that. The other thing is that we do have to be competitive with the other listings. So the comps might be telling you one story, but you do have to look at what your quote unquote competition is doing, right? Because we're not competing with those old comps, we're competing with the deals that are actively listed. So I like to go look at saying, what's my competition doing? And so if they've undercut the market, well, unfortunately I probably have to either wait or undercut them too. Right, there's again, there's a finite number of buyers out there, so we've got to be competitive. We got to be what people call the next logical sale in the market. I think that's a really great, great way to think about it. Put yourself in the shoes of a buyer. It's based on my marketing, based on my price, based on my customer service, based on everything. Would I be the one 
that a buyer would take. If you're not that, fix that. And the last point to making a quarter million dollars is mastering the skill of talking. How I've gotten good at rambling to a video camera is actually just from talking to sellers. Because a lot of times these conversations that you have with sellers, you get to start with one little seed, one little topic, right? It might be their property. And you've got to turn that into a full-blown conversation. You've got to be a conversationalist. Now, this is a little bit different because this is a monologue, but getting good at talking to sellers is really important. This false notion that a lot of new land investors have is, Summer, I'm nervous because I don't know everything about the property. I'm nervous that what if they call me out and call my bluff, I'm a new land investor, yada, yada, yada. It doesn't really work that way. And in fact, knowing everything about the property is not really a much of a value add. I think the best thing that you can go into these calls with is really looking at it from a couple of different angles. One, when you go into these calls, I want you to think about why is the seller on the call with me, right? Why did the seller reach out from an unsolicited piece of marketing? Every seller has a story. It's up to you to unearth what that story is, okay? So figure out what that is. Because we want to ideally build offers based off of the seller's needs, not based off of the value of the property, right? You can see how you're never going to get home run deals just saying, I'm going to offer you 50% of what the property's worth, but you will get home run deals solving the problem of the seller. And they might Their problem might look like, I just need X amount for X reason. Give me that, you can have the property. Now we're bartering off of their problems, not off the value of the property that gets you in a much better situation. In fact, when we look at how home run deals come to be in this business, it's usually because of that, or someone's just so unaware of what their property is worth. That unawareness is very rare. This situation, much more plausible, right? So we wanna figure out why are they on the call with us? Why are they looking to sell the property? Why haven't they sold it before? Why now? Why not use a realtor? And on top of that, you've got to be genuinely curious about the questions you ask, right? And that's why I say sometimes knowing all of the answers before about the property removes any curiosity. And I'll listen to sellers' calls of the, our, our new members, and it's like, dude, you sound like a robot on here because you already know the answer, and you're asking a question that doesn't matter. Don't ask questions that you don't care about the answer to, right? If you want to be a good conversationalist, be a good listener and ask good questions. Part of asking good questions is actually kind of sitting on the edge of your seat to know the answer. Don't just ask layup questions that you know the answer to. And so one of the things that we take Leah members through on our sales training calls, is we take them through calling leads where they have no background on them because it forces you to get creative and think on the fly and it also forces you to be a good conversationalist. The next area for talking to sellers is really the money's in the follow-up, okay? We had one of our Leah members post this the other day. He had a deal that he made 35 grand on net after all fees. And this comprised of, and this was through his team, not through him, comprised of over 70 phone calls, 90 texts, and like 100 emails, right, to get that deal done over months. The, what I love about that is that most people aren't willing to do that, right? Most land investors just take the low-hanging fruit and they move on. But you look at someone like me or someone like a Leah member who knows the systems of following up, knows the cadence, and knows what happens when they stay in the game long-term, it's magic, right? Because you really have no competition at that point. So to be good at working seller leads, what you need to do is figure out why are they on the call with you? Why sell now? Why not use a realtor? Why, 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 why? Ask questions that you're genuinely interested in. Don't over prepare for these calls. Just be a human. Right? They want to do business with someone that they know, like, and trust. It's rarely just about the price, right? A lot of these properties have a story and they want to make sure they're passing it off into someone that they know, like, and trust, right? It's not always just about price. And the next thing that you need to think about is following up and having a framework that you can use in terms of you know exactly when to follow up, how to follow up, what that follow up looks like and eventually delegating that out to your team on your behalf so you guys can kind of scale the number of leads that you can speak to and the frequency at which you can follow up. And so if you can master these three points, right, which really this is probably a 90 day process to get pretty damn lethal at this, that's a quarter million plus in your first year, right? We have many, many lead members that eclipse a quarter million, 300K in their first year. If you're really all in on this business, we've had folks that have eclipsed 400, $500,000. And we've had folks eclipse a million dollars in profit their second year with us, right? That's because having the right information at the right time and having a playbook that's been battle tested. So if you guys want to learn more about how we do this and how you can kind of piggyback and ride on our coattails of the framework that we've created, go to landinvestor.co slash apply. You'll find that down in the bio. Come speak to the team and I. We'll lay out our full entire roadmap. I'm a big believer of just giving it all away, right? People only pay us for implementation. People don't pay us just for information, okay? And so we'll give it all away to you and get you on your merry way. Take care, guys.